Hi, we're here in John chapter 1 in our series Among Us, a four-week series here leading up to Christmas. John 1, 14 says, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John bare witness of Him and cried, saying, This was He of whom I spake. He that cometh after me is preferred before me, for He was before me. And of his fullness have all we received in grace for grace. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. No man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. Lord, we come before you asking you to help us really focus on you being among us and what that means, Lord. We looked at at your deity last week, Lord, and the fact that you are... 100% God, Lord, and now this week we focus on the fact that you're 100% man and what that means, God, and all that you've done for us through, through this incarnation, you coming here to take on the form of a man, Lord, all that it means, and we just thank you for that, God. I don't think we even grasp it fully, but Lord, help us just to understand it a little bit better this morning. Please, in Jesus' name we pray, amen. So we're in week two of the This four-week series going into Christmas. Um, We're taking this time to prepare ourselves for an encounter with God. Because that's ultimately what the incarnation is. That's what we're celebrating at Christmas is God coming to be with us. His name was said to be Emmanuel, God with us. So God is coming here to be with us. So we want to encounter him. We want to learn more about him. We want to know who he is. And and that's what we're we're taking this time for. I, I mentioned in the prayer we looked at the fact that Jesus is 100% God, but this week we're going to look at the uh, flip side of that, and that is that God entered this world to take on the form of a man. So what does it mean that God took on flesh, and as John put it, dwelt among us? The word dwelt means to, to tent or encamp, figuratively to occupy as a mansion, or especially to reside as God did in the tabernacle of old, a symbol of protection and communion. That's uh, James Strong's definition here. And I want us to focus on this to reside, he says, as God did in the tabernacle of old, a symbol of protection and communion. God came in in, in the Old Testament, if you understand it, he was in the tabernacle or later the temple. But that tabernacle, that tent that they would set up in the midst of the the children of Israel when they would encamp, um, he would be in them. That's where he was. That's where his, his glory dwelt. And he would be there amongst his people. That tabernacle is a picture of what Jesus came to do here with us. He dwelt among us. He tabernacled among us. He lived among us. He came so we could be where he's at. So he could bring God's glory here to us and we can see it. We could be a part of it. By using this word, John's giving a very clear picture of what it meant that God dwelt among his people in the flesh. The tabernacle's main purpose was to provide a physical manifestation of God's holiness on earth. The layout of the tabernacle, the contents, the vessels, the furniture, the materials that it was even made of, all of this looked back to some element of God's character and and our need to approach the holy cautiously and respectfully. All of it pointed back to that. Every aspect of the tabernacle, when you read through it, You can get lost in it. It's so detailed, but every single bit of that points back to some aspect of God. Um, Even all the sacrifices point back to some aspect of the sacrifice of Christ and what he was doing for us. And and maybe one of these days I'll do a study on that, on those different sacrifices and and what they mean. Um, But I don't think we grasp fully what salvation means for us. There's so much in it. And, and, and God gave us pictures of all of it. And he's giving us another picture. He's saying that tabernacle in the Old Testament, he says, that's me here. That's what I am here. I'm here with you. I'm here where you can come to me. And it's through Christ we know that we have access to the Father now. Okay, we can go boldly to the throne of grace. Why? Because we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. So that tabernacle was also a place where humanity could come and and worship God. The Dictionary of Biblical Imagery states, In this way, the author of the gospel intends us to see Jesus as the fulfillment of the tabernacle. God is indeed present among men and women. Amen. This act of tabernacling among us is a gift from God. It is, you could say, the first gift of Christmas. 
is God among us. That's the first gift. That's the gift. And, and, and when we say God among us, it, it means so much more than just, I think almost we take it for granted, but it's, it's God is here with us and he took on human flesh. I mean, think about it. He came as a baby. He came as a baby. He could have come any way he wanted, but he chose to come as a baby and, and submit himself to parents raising him to the limitations of a human body from the time of birth. Before then, really, but the time of conception all the way through. But we understand that just being limited to, to, to the body of a baby. He took on that form. Why? So he could understand our infirmities. So he could understand what we go through. So he could empathize with us. So he can be close with us. So he can know us. Or rather, he does know us even without doing that. He knows everything about us. But rather, so we could relate to him better. Is everything he does is to for our benefit. Everything he does is to help us. That's what this gift was. But this gift comes with additional presents. Like a Christmas present which you open and discover is filled with treasures, so too God's presence among us gives us many more blessings. First, we're going to see the glory of God. It's not an insignificant gift. What did Moses, who had a great relationship with God, ask for? He says, show me your glory. But God told Moses he could not see God directly or he'd die. He only let Moses catch a glimpse. His backside, really. He, he covered him. He blocked him. He said, you get in this cleft, and when I pass by, I'll let you see, you know, my hinder parts. You can see the back of me. He blocked him with his hand as he went by or he'd have died, and he was allowed to see the back of his glory. Moses comes off the mountain, and then... You know, they say, cover yourself because your face is just glowing. It was scaring everybody because he'd been in the presence of God. They were afraid of him. They, they feared Moses because he was that close with God. And Jesus in human flesh, it veils that glory, but it brings that glory down to us. If we saw the glory of God, we would die too. But the, the humanity veils it and, and protects us from it, just like the tabernacle did. And by the way, there were strict rules to going into the, to, the, to the Holy of Holies, which was within that tabernacle. Only one person could do it once a year. That was on the Day of Atonement, and that was the high priest, and he had to follow a set, set order in how he did it. He couldn't just go in haphazardly. But what was protecting everyone else from dying was that, that tabernacle, that tent, that outer covering. That's what protects us from God's glory with Jesus here. That's why we can look at God in the flesh and not die is because his glory is shielded. That's a, By the way, that's a... Uh, I, I'm losing the word that it is, but that's something that critics will use um, against us, say that there's a contradiction in the Bible, is that, well, if Jesus is God, then how come you can see him and not die? Well, that's the answer. Okay, his glory is veiled, um, protecting us through his flesh. So, Moses sees God, and he can only catch a glimpse of his glory. But John declares that when the word took on flesh, when Jesus was born, we beheld the glory of God. And that's what it says right there in verse 14. The word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father. Secondly, in the present of Jesus coming in the flesh, we have grace and truth. So we have the glory of God, and then we have grace and truth. So three presents that come with the incarnation. The greatest Christmas gift is... Jesus. It is Jesus being here. And when we understand salvation and, and all that comes with it, it, it's really all about Jesus Christ. And it brings so much more with it. More than just grace and truth, we're just looking at this passage. There's so much we get with that. But it's Jesus. Jesus is the gift. And, and, and with that gift comes so many other blessings. And we just need to remind ourselves of that. So let me ask you, though, as we focus on these three gifts that come with Jesus, what are you doing with the gift of His glory, with His grace, and with His truth? What are you doing with them? And we'll dive into that a little bit more here. The glory of God is God's magnificence and all He is coming down to be in our presence, or we could say it places us in His presence and magnificence. So it's all that God is coming down to us and us being able to be in the presence of that. That's what the glory of God is in the incarnation or God being here in the flesh. We say God incarnate. All right. So the glory of God refers to six things. We're going to look at five of them. The six deals with uh, 
boasting, so that's not really uh, effective here in what we're talking about. Or glory, rather, refers to six things, but um, when we look at the glory of God, it refers to five. First, it means praise. Um, secondly, it refers to God's holiness, His exalted magnificence, His divine perfection. Thirdly, it refers to the splendor and wealth of a king in his kingdom. Fourth, it refers to the brilliant light which surrounds the presence of God. And then fifth, it refers to beauty. So this is what Jesus brings with him. This is what comes down with him. So praise, holiness, magnificence, perfection, splendor, basically the wealth of a king, his kingdom coming here. And, and we understand all that, the brilliant light which surrounds the presence of God uh, in him is, is, is light. Uh, the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not, we hear. Um, verse 9, that was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world, speaking about Jesus. So Jesus is that light. Um, he brings that with him. That's what he brings with him. It also refers to beauty. So these are the things that he brings down with him. All right, this is what God's glory is. When the Bible says the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, it refers to all of the above, the praise, the splendor, the wealth, the light, the beauty, all of that being in our presence through Jesus Christ. That's what it's referring to. Now, this glory places us in the presence of the Father. Think about that. Jesus said, I and my Father are one. Okay, this glory that he brings with him puts us in the presence of God. Look at verse 14. It says, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we know that word is God, right? Because we looked at that last week. All right, the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Look at this. And we beheld his glory, who? The word's glory. And what does it say about this glory? The glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So this is the glory as of the only begotten of the Father. So he gets it from his Father. That's where that glory comes from. It puts us in the presence of the Father as well. I and my Father are one. So this glory places us in the presence of the Father. Through the glory of Christ, we see the Father. In John 8, 19, the Bible says, Then saith they unto him, Where is thy father? Jesus answered, Ye neither know me nor my father. If ye had known me, ye should have known my father also. Again, I and my father are one. So it puts us in the presence of the Father. Through the glory of Christ, we see the Father. John 14, go ahead and turn there. Turn to John 14, 6. Because we're going to read a few, uh, a few verses there. John 14, 6. Most of us are familiar with this verse. We'll read through verse 11. It says, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And again, I want to remind us through the glory of Christ, we see the Father. So, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. If ye had known me, ye should have known my Father also. He's talking to his disciples. He's talking to uh, Thomas. Okay, Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest. How can we know the way? And he said, I'm the way. If ye had known me, ye should have known my Father also. And from henceforth ye know him and have seen him. What? We've seen him. Why? Because when we're in Christ's presence, we're in the presence of the Father. We see the glory of Christ. We see the glory of the Father. We see it all. This is what Jesus brought to him. He's bringing heaven with him. That's what he brings with him. We get to be in the presence of that when we're near Christ. When we're around Christ, this is what the incarnation is. It's God coming down to man. It's just like in the Garden of Eden. Hey, Adam, where art thou? It's God coming to man. Why? For his benefit. Was it for God's benefit? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. It's for our benefit. Why did Christ come here? For our benefit. For our benefit. He brought his glory And from henceforth ye know him and have seen him. Verse 8, Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He's like, What? Lord, I asked about your Father. He said, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. It'll satisfy us to show us the Father. And Jesus says, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? What's he saying? You've seen the Father. You know me, don't you, Philip? That's, that's the implied ac accusation. You know me, don't you, Philip? Then you know the Father. Then you know the Father. He that hath seen me hath seen the Father, and how sayest thou then, show us the Father? Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself. For the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. 
Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very work's sake. So he's saying, I'm, I'm right here. The Father's right here. You've seen him. We are in the presence of God when we get in the presence of Jesus Christ. We're in the presence of the Father when we're in the presence of Jesus Christ. He brought all that glory with him. We've got to put ourselves there. You have to be around him. Why, why could he say that to Philip? Because Philip was around him. And again, this goes back to what I preached on Wednesday about being a disciple, being a follower of him. Well, how can, remember when I said, J.D., come follow me, let's go. Grace teaches us. Titus 2.11, for the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. All right, we're talking about the grace of God, and the grace of God brought salvation, right? It says it's appeared to all men. So what the context of what we're looking at, the subject of what we're looking at is the grace of God. All right, the grace of God does something here, verse 12, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. So what does grace do? It teaches us. Grace is our teacher, and it's some specific things that this could be a whole message itself, but it teaches us to deny ungodliness. Grace teaches us uh, to deny worldly lusts. It teaches us to live soberly, to live righteously, to live godly in this present world. That's what grace does. Grace, therefore, based on the Bible, is not an excuse to go sin. What, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? What's God's answer? We should have this memorized. God forbid. Where's that found? Somebody help me out. Where can you find that? You ought to be able to spit that out. Romans chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. Romans chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. See, grace doesn't teach us that I have a license to sin now. Well, hey, we're, 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 we're sin abounded. Grace did much more abound, right? We're reading that in Romans chapter 5, and then you get to Romans 6. What then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Because it's there, right? God forbid. So it's not a license to go sin. Well, I'm under grace. I can do what I want. That's unbiblical. No, I'm under grace. I can do that. No, that's unbiblical. You didn't get that from the Bible. I'll tell you that right now. Because grace teaches you to deny ungodliness and worldly lusts. Grace is our teacher. It's for our good. Grace is only to help us. It's to enable us. Remember, if grace is God's enabling power, God's not going to enable us to sin. Uh -uh, he's not going to enable us to sin. He's going to enable us to overcome that sin. He's not going to help us sin. Now, thankfully for the blood of Christ, it can forgive and wash away all sin, but he's not going to help us to sin. God's not going to do that. So grace teaches us. This is important that God's grace cannot be separated from truth. God's grace cannot be separated from truth. I mentioned earlier, I said uh, a popular saying right now is, I'm under grace. That's not according to truth. And when I say I'm under grace means, I, well, I can do that. I can, well, I can go there. I can say that. I can watch that. I can act that way. I'm under grace. But that's not according to truth. Grace and truth are never separated from one another. Grace and truth are never separated. Jesus Christ, we're told, is the one that brought grace and truth because He is truth. John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And remember, we saw in John 1, 14 and 17, grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. He brought them. He brought both grace and truth. They're not separated from one another. They're interconnected. They work together. John 1.17 says the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Colossians 1.6, which is come unto you as it is in all the world and bringeth forth fruit as it doth also in you since the day ye heard of it and knew the grace of God in truth. The grace of God in truth. 2 John 3, grace be with you, mercy and peace from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father. How? In truth and love. Grace be with you. How? In truth and love. They're not separate from one another. They're interconnected. You can't have one without the other. You can't have one without the other. Truth is our guide and our armor. And we, we saw that. I'm not going to go back into Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 18, but we're to have our loins girt about with truth. Okay? So truth is our guide and our armor. Remember, Jesus Christ bought, brought grace and truth. 1 Corinthians 13, 6, we're told that charity rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth. Charity, biblical love, rejoices in 
truth. If someone cares enough about you to bring something, some sin in your life to your attention, you're probably going to get mad. But you need to be spiritually mature enough to know that they're doing it because they love you. Because nobody, well, maybe not nobody, most people, godly people, godly people don't even want to do it. They don't want to have to bring that to you. They're doing it because they love you. People that care don't want to come and hurt someone and, and, and bring up possible, you know, the loss of a friendship or whatever it may be. They don't want that. But charity doesn't rejoice in iniquity. It rejoices in truth. Because truth is what helps people, by the way. Can I say just lying to people and telling a, a little boy that he's a girl does not help them? Okay, charity rejoices in truth. That'll help a Christian right there. You, you're, someone's whacked out if they think, if they say I'm saved and I think that, that there's, you know, transgender and all this, that that, that that little boy or that little girl that thinks they're the opposite. No, there's, there's no biblical truth to that. Okay, that's not right. That's wrong. That's false. That's error. Because charity rejoices in the truth. And the truth is, if you were born a boy, God meant you to be a boy. If you were born a girl, God meant you to be a girl, period. Now, there may be problems associated with that. You may have to go through some things to think through it. I'm not saying that doesn't exist because everyone has problems. Some of us are just focused. We have different problems, okay? Everyone has different problems. But it does not mean that God meant for you to be, or for instance, for me, I feel like I'm a girl, so I must be a girl. Nope, God meant me to be a boy because that's what I am. So to encourage somebody in that fallacy is not love and it's not biblical because charity rejoices in truth, in truth. That's where charity rejoices is in truth. It's like somebody saying, well, I, you know, I was born, I'm just an angry person. Oh, okay, well, God must have wanted you to be a murderer. No, you fight that. Yeah, maybe I'm, whatever, predisposed to being angry. So then I guess I get to be a murderer not my fault. This is how God made me. That's the argument that people are, are making. Well, I feel like I'm a girl. So what? Fight it. It's wrong. It's not truth. It's wrong. Just like the angry person saying, well, I just beat my wife because God made me an angry person. No, you fight that. You don't do that. That's wrong. You don't do that. When we start applying the Bible to, to life, it makes things very clear. It makes things very clear and it'll help us. Truth is our guide and our armor. Ephesians 1.13, it says, In whom ye also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. What? They heard the word of truth, the gospel. It's our guide. Ephesians 4.15, But speaking the truth in love may grow up unto, into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. Look, speaking the truth... In love. That's why I said we have to, especially when you're debating somebody, it can get heated. You have to, maybe you have to say, I, I can't anymore. I got to stop because I'm going to start being mean. It's okay to tell somebody that I can't do this anymore. You know, sometimes maybe with family, you're getting in a debate over, over something biblical and you guys are in disagreement. You say, you know what? I need to just stop right now because I'm about to get mean and nasty and I don't want to do that. So let, let, I got to back off of this. Do that because we're to speak the truth in love. I'm telling you this. I'm telling you you're wrong, essentially, because I love you. Because what you believe doesn't line up with what God says. But it has to be. We have to be the ambassadors for truth, but the ambassadors for, for presenting the truth in love. Kindly, graciously, or as the Lord would do it. Ephesians 5, 9 says, For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth. It's the truth. 2 Thessalonians 2, 12 and 13. I've, I've just got some verses I'm going to read through here. That they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. So Jesus Christ brought grace and truth. 2 Timothy 2.15, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. 
Jesus brought grace and truth. Remember, when we're fighting error, when we're in a spiritual battle, we are fighting false doctrine. So our weapon is the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of truth. Okay, it's the word of God. It's truth. 2 Timothy 2.25, In meekness instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. Jesus brought grace and truth. 1 Peter 1.22, Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently. You purified your souls, he says, in obeying the truth through the Spirit. 1 John 1, 6. If we say that we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. 3 John 4. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. John said that. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. What's he talking about? Those that I'm teaching. Those that, that I'm imparting this knowledge to. I have no greater joy than to hear that you walk in truth. That you're living this out. This is what he wanted. He wanted them to walk in truth. He wanted them to know this. There's no greater joy than that he hears that his children walk in truth. He's striving for that. Well, how are they going to walk in truth? Because Jesus is truth. Because they're being like him. Because they're following him. This is what God wants for us. This is God's desire for you. This is what the incarnation means. Is that you come and here I am. I'm presenting myself. I, I came to show you what you should be. What you can be. I bring my glory. I'm showing you all that I am. I'm giving you a glimpse into that. And I bring grace to help you to walk in truth. That's what God wants for you. What are you doing with the gift of the incarnation? Does God's glorious presence affect the way you are living your life? Does Him having come here affect the way that you are living your life? It ought to. It ought to. You ought to be separating from the things of this world. Grace teaches us to deny ungodliness. Is His grace demonstrated through how you're living your life? By the way, that grace is going to be imparted. People are going to see it in the way you treat them. It's not just, well, we separate from the world. We're separate from the world. Yeah, but we're kind to others as well because the world's not always kind, is it? So separating from the world then means that I be kind to people. It means then that I, that I don't look down my nose at someone that's transgender. Okay? That's what it means. Somebody that's gay, I don't look down my nose at them. I invite them to church. I ask them to sit by me if they come and visit at church. I help them to know the Lord. I point them to Jesus. That's what it means. This is how we're to treat people. It's not just grace teaches me to be separate from the world. Yes, I'm separate from that, but I also come with truth. And truth, hey, we're to bring them the truth in, in, in kindness, in love. Care for people. Hey, none of us were worthy of Jesus Christ showing up here. Not one of us. He could look, he could just, justly look down his nose at every single one of us and say, Get away from me, you sinner. What are you doing in my presence? You have no right to be by me. And he'd have been right. But he didn't do that, did he? So who are we to look down our nose at him? Do you know how filthy and stinky we must have been to God? But he says, I'll come down there. I'll reach you because I love you. And if we're his ambassadors, then who are we to look down our nose at somebody to reject somebody that he didn't? We help them. We help them. We point them to the Savior. We pray for them. If we care, don't forget to silence your phones. Does the truth he brought through his word determine how you live your life, every area? The greatest Christmas gift is the incarnation of Jesus Christ. How are you treating people? How does him coming here affect the way you live? Do you know Christ as your Savior? Have you been born again? As far as I know, everybody in here has. But maybe not. Maybe you haven't. And that's the most important thing you can deal with is, is that you know that Jesus Christ is your Savior, that you've turned to Him, you've called on the name of the Lord so you can have your sins forgiven. 
have you done that? If not, do it right now. There's nothing stopping you but you. God wants you saved. He already proved that by dying on the cross for you. What's holding you back? Don't wait. Do it now. Today's the day of salvation. And Christians, are you living a life that demonstrates the grace of God at work in your life? I hope we all are to some degree. But are there things that we can work on? Maybe your attitude, your demeanor, the, the holiness in your life. Maybe the way you look at certain people where you're not treating them right. I don't know what it is, what the Lord wants for you, but please take this time as we, we have an invitation to, to talk to the Lord and to fix those things, to get them right, to confess that sin, to tear that wall down that's hindering your closeness to Him, to remove that sin in your life, to stop that sin that simply pushes Him away from you and pushes you closer to the world. Father, we love you. We thank you for the word of God. Please, Lord, help us as we prepare, Lord, for the incarnation, Lord, as we need that reality in our lives. As we focus on what it means that you came here, thank you for the gifts you brought with you. Your glory, Lord, all that you are, who you are, what you are. That we can spend time in that. I have to tell you something. Well, how can he hear me if he doesn't follow me? So how can we hear from God? How can we know about God if we don't follow him? We got to be in his presence. We have to be where he's at. Through the incarnation, we also get a small glimpse into the magnificence of God's kingdom, his governance, his priesthood, and his truth presented through preaching. We get a small glimpse into all of that as we look at that definition of of glory. Remember, <clears throat> so I want to back up and find where I put it. So it refers to God's holiness, his magnificence, his divine perfection, the splendor and wealth of a king in his kingdom, the brilliant light, and then his beauty. So through the incarnation, we get a glimpse into the magnificence of God's kingdom, his, his governance even. We see all these things. How, how does God run things? What's his, his order of operation? How does he do things? We see all that when we're around Jesus, when we get in his word and we see that his priesthood, that he's there on be, in our behalf. He, he's representing us to God. He's doing all these things for us and his truth presented through preaching, because that's how we hear truth. When we look at the life of Christ, when he was here, when he was incarnate, when it was God in the flesh here on earth, what is? how does he present this truth? He preaches it. He preaches the truth, so we see all that. So God's incarnation brings his glory, but it also brings two more presents, which are grace and truth. If we look at verse 14 of John chapter 1, verse number 14 of John chapter 1, <clears throat> We're told, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So he shows up, and he's full of grace and truth. Verse 17, the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by who? By Jesus Christ. Grace and truth come by Jesus Christ. So he doesn't just bring with him his glory. He also brings grace and truth. And this is something that God saw important to point out, that he comes with grace and truth. So it brings that with it. Grace, or we could say the enabling power of God, has always been an absolute necessity for mankind. Look, when, when man tried to do it by himself in the Garden of Eden, it was way insufficient. Okay, and what's the picture we have in the Garden of Eden that man's dealing with his problems by himself were insufficient? Can somebody tell me? What's the first problem that presents itself to man? And God doesn't say it, but he does something in regard to how they tried to fix the problem. Adam and Eve. Sin, okay, and what did sin do? It separated, okay, but let's, 
let's think specifics in the Garden of Eden, what took place that was insufficient. Okay, they sinned, and then what happened to them? They tried to cover themselves, right? And what did they use? Fig leaves. And what did God do? Coats of skin. Because their covering, their work, was insufficient. It was insufficient. Their eyes were open, and they saw that they were naked, and they tried to cover it up. And that's about the way they covered it up is about how, how people in this world cover up their nakedness today. Okay? Because you go out. You, you go to, to a beach or something and you look and, and how are people covered up? Well, it's just barely anything up here for the girls and barely something down here for the girls and barely something down here for the guys. And that's it. And God says that is insufficient. So what does he do? He gives them a full coat. What is that? Think of it like a trench coat. Okay? Who knows what a trench coat is? You know, the old detectives used to wear a trench coat. That big old long coat comes down to here. That's what he gives them to cover up with. He said, cover your nakedness. Because what you did is insufficient. See, that's God coming and enabling man, helping man. We've always needed it. We've always needed God's help, His enabling power. It's always been nece necessary for us. Genesis 6, 8, it says, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Grace has always been needed. And again, grace is, is yes, us getting something we don't deserve, but I think it means much more than that. I, I think a better definition of grace is God's enabling power. It's God doing something we can't do. God doing something for us we can't do. God's enabling power. Grace makes salvation possible for a hopeless mankind. Grace makes salvation possible. We can't save ourselves, can we? See, man's covering was insufficient. That's what Adam and Eve tried to do. See, they took leaves off a plant to cover themselves. God says that's not sufficient to cover your sin. So he gives them skins from an animal. What does that indicate? A sacrifice. A sacrifice that blood was shed. Immediately the picture's there. Immediately the picture's there. To cover your sin, blood must be shed. Without the shedding of blood, the Bible says there's no remission of sins. Blood must be shed. Man's work is insufficient, so we need God. Grace makes salvation possible for a hopeless mankind. Romans chapter 3, verse 24. Go ahead and turn there with me if you would, please. Romans chapter 3, verse 24. <clears throat> Romans 3 24 says being justified freely by his what his grace there it is we see God's grace justified freely what does justified mean declared righteous declared righteous she's listening praise the Lord I'm glad being justified freely by his grace Look at this, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. It comes through Christ, through the redemption. That's the purchasing. Okay, look at this. Continue through verse 25. Whom God, speaking about Jesus Christ, whom God hath set forth to be a what? Propitiation. What does that mean? The satisfaction of a debt. The satisfaction of a debt. Whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. There's a whole lot there, but basically we see the blood again, that it, that what Jesus Christ did satisfied the debt that we owe, and it's through faith in His blood, and through that we're declared righteous. God's grace has always been necessary for mankind. It makes salvation possible. Romans chapter 5, verses 20 and 21, Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Amen. The law entered that the offense might abound. What's that talking about? The law entered to show you you're guilty. To show you, like, look, if it's just, if the only law that's there is thou shalt not bear false witness, how many times have you lied? That's more than enough. More, I've, everyone in here has lied more times than they can even count. Every one of you, you don't even know how many times you've lied. It's been that many times. If it was just that, the law entered that the offense might abound. So you can know, man, I'm guilty before God. I know it. And, and people make excuses for their sin all the time. They want, it's not sin. It's a disease. Whatever it is, it doesn't matter. Hey, when you stand before God, you're going to know that you have broken His laws, that you're guilty, and that you're going to get exactly what you deserve. That's what's going to happen. The law entered that the offense might abound. You say, well, I didn't understand that. I didn't know. That's no excuse for it. That's no excuse because the law of God is written on your hearts. 
And if someone truly doesn't understand it, like a young child or somebody who's maybe mentally retarded, then God has an exception for that. God understands that. He shall not the judge of all the earth do right? Absolutely. He's not going to do something that's unjust. He won't do that. But those that have the comprehension that understand it, you're going to be held accountable. You're going to be held accountable. The law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, look at this. So the offense abounds. And he says where sin abounded, I mean, you think of something in abundance. It's abounding. It's boom. There's so much more than you ever need. That's sin. But look at this. Grace did much more abound. God said, here I am. I'm showing up. Is the propitiation. I'm going to satisfy that debt. It's huge. You got you're going to be working forever to pay it off. You're never going to pay it off. It's that big. And here I am. Yeah, praise God for that. Here I am to take care of that debt that you owe. I've satisfied it. Where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. That as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. Ephesians 2, 8, 9. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Romans eleven six. And if by grace, then is it no more of works? Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then is it no more grace? Otherwise, work is no more work. What in the world did I just say? It's saying, hey, if it's by grace, then it cannot have anything to do with works. If it's by works, it can't have anything to do with grace. They're mutually exclusive of one another. Salvation only comes by grace is what it's saying. That means there's no works involved on your behalf. Jesus Christ did it all. He's the propitiation. He's the redeemer. He's the justifier. And it's through his blood. He did it all. Grace. Hopeless mankind needs the grace of God. It makes salvation possible. Grace also makes serving God possible. Don't forget that. There's so much attention is made on the fact of, of, of grace is, is necessary for salvation and it's without works and it, for good reason because so much of, of, of religion out there says that you got to do something in order to gain God's favor to be right with God. So, so we say, hold on, that's not at all what the Bible teaches. The Bible says that it's all by grace through faith and it's not of works. It's the gift of God. But grace isn't just to save somebody because God says, I'm not just going to leave you hanging. I care about you. I'm going to help you to serve me after you get saved. So grace enables us to serve God through the rest of our life. It makes living a holy separated life possible. Go to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. <clears throat> Romans 12.1. Grace makes living a holy, separated life possible. Okay? We have to understand this when we serve God. It, it's, it's through His enabling power. We need His help to do it. Don't go about it in your flesh. Lean on God. Say, well, how do I even do that? Well, go to Him. Go to His Word and say, God, okay, what do you want me doing then? And just start going through it and reading it and letting Him speak to you. And then take it to Him and say, God, I, I'm not good at that. I've messed up. I failed you in this area. So many times, God, I need your help. God, please help me. Encourage me. Show me my way out of this. Give, give me the path, the steps to take and be there listening. And you, you hear from him through his word. You, you read his word. You spend time in his word. That's what we need to do. We need to go to him because his grace is there to help us serve him, to live a holy, separated life. Romans 12, 1, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Oh my, see, again, I'm going to go back to that music, that thing I told you about. Let that music flow through you. Godly music, godly lyrics that are going to renew your mind. The Word of God, let that flow through you because it's going to change your thinking through the renewing of your mind. You'll be transformed. And that's what we're looking for. I don't want to think like this world. I want to think like God. And God, by the way, is the antithesis to this world. We want to think like God, not like the world. And most of us think like the world and not like God. And we need to think like God. 
So we're not to be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. For I say through the grace given unto me. He says, here's how I say this. I'm able to say this through the grace given unto me. What? To, to present your body as a living sacrifice. He, he does it through grace. He's able to say it through grace. To every man, for I say through the grace of, given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. What's he saying? Hey, it's through grace that you can do this. It's through grace that you can live a wholly separated life. It's through grace that God can enable you to do these things. Um, that I can even tell you these things. It's through God's grace, through God's enabling power that we can do this. It's God's grace. We need it. It'll make living a wholly separated life possible. Grace also enables us to exercise our spiritual gifts within the body of Christ. Go to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, verse 5. <clears throat> Romans chapter 12, verse 5. So we being many are one body in Christ and every one members one of another. So it's talking about the body of Christ. We being many are one body in Christ. He's talking to a local church there in Rome. Okay, that's what the body of Christ is. It's a local church. All right, so we being many are one body in Christ and every one members one of another. Look at this, having then gifts differing according. Why are the gifts differing? Why do we have different gifts? What's it according to? According to what? The grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith, or ministry, let us wait on our ministering, or he that teacheth on teaching, or he that exhorteth on exhortation, he that giveth, let him do it with simplicity, he that ruleth with diligence, he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. How are we able to do these things? How are we able to exercise these gifts? According to the grace that's given to us. Grace allows you and me to exercise our spiritual gifts within the Lord's church. It's grace. Grace enables us to do that. Grace enables us to build and labor for God. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Grace enables us to build and labor for God. 1 Corinthians 3, 9, it says, For we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building according to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder. I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. So what's he saying? According to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder. He says, here's how I can build you. Here's how I can help you. It's through the grace of God. It's through the grace of God. And it's the same for anybody else coming behind him. You're going to help people. You're going to encourage people. You're going to help people to grow. You're going to build people up. It's through the grace of God. So grace enables us to build and labor for God. Grace also teaches us. Go to Titus 2.11. Grace teaches us. The Lord rejoicing in that, worshiping you. The Lord, also the grace and truth you brought that you want to help us to, to be that. To show that to other people. Lord, help us to do it better. Forgive us for failing you. Forgive us for being selfish. Being self-righteous for being ungrateful. Lord, please help us to be kind to others, to represent you well, Lord, just in the things we say, the things we don't say. God, please let kindness describe us as we step into this world and, and represent you, please. I ask you to bless this invitation, Lord, and if anyone's here that doesn't know you as Savior, that today they would take care of that. God, those of us that do know you as Savior, that we would really look to ourselves and forsake our sin, Lord, and cleave to you, please. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The invitation's open. It's time for you to.